This past weekend marked two years since Russia's all-out war on Ukraine. To talk about that and more, I'm joined in studio by one of the world's preeminent experts on U.S. relations with both countries. Matt Rojanski is a lawyer, national security advisor, and president and CEO of the U.S.-Russia Foundation for Economic Advancement and the Rule of Law. He joins us ahead of his appearance tonight as part of the World Affairs Council's Distinguished Lecture Series. Matthew Rojanski, thank you so much for being here this morning. Thanks for having me, Anne. And I'm also joined by Britt Hester, also from the World Affairs Council, who is bringing this event to town. Welcome, Britt. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, Matthew, people often frame what is happening in Russia today around the Cold War as, as in, you know, we thought the Cold War was over, we were mistaken. Um, but so many current global hostilities seem to be essentially rekindled versions of old or even ancient hostilities. Can these conflicts ever truly be won, resolved, over? It's, it's funny you ask it that way, and uh, for a while I was thinking about writing a book called Ancient Hatreds, and I was going to go around the periphery of Eurasia, um, you know, the, the former Soviet countries around Russia, but also, you know, down into the Indian subcontinent and the Middle East and Europe, and kind of tell the stories of these seemingly endless conflicts that maybe kind of go into a pause um, sometimes it's because a, a powerful neighbor, an empire, kind of just takes over and puts almost like a bell jar over a, a local conflict. And sometimes it's because one side just wins and dominates for a while. Um, other times it's because of changing technology or moving populations that can kind of change the balance of power for a certain amount of time. What doesn't change, though, is the human story, the human element. Um, People very often remember and hand down and kind of mythologize victimhood. Um, this is one of the biggest challenges that we've had in the history of Eastern Europe. Um, this is kind of how I cut my teeth in this space, was actually studying uh, the story of the middle of the 20th century, which has been called the Bloodlands, the, the tragedies of Stalinism and, of course, Hitler, the Holocaust, and World War II. Um, and, you know, much of the competing narratives that we see around the war between Russia and Ukraine now on both sides are inflected by these memories and are now, again, turbocharged by the new suffering that is happening, the new atrocities, the killings, the occupation. Um, it, it seems very likely to me that however this war proceeds, and I'm hesitant even to say that it's going to end because I have a lot of trouble seeing what that end point looks like from the vantage point of today, I am certain that these newly forged memories of pain and suffering and victimhood will continue to fuel future generations of conflict just as exactly as the 20th century and even the 19th century's memories have in our time. And I know you've written about the fact that we often focus on the conflict and perhaps don't give enough attention to what follows a conflict, which is in many ways more challenging, more difficult than dealing with a warfare type circumstance. And Certainly, whatever does happen in Ukraine will be a monumental task of trying to rebuild or, or lead or govern whoever's in charge. Look, we should have no illusions about where the proximate cause or the responsibility for this war lies. It's with Vladimir Putin, right? He did not have to invade Ukraine two years ago. In fact, many of us didn't think he would because it seemed like such an irrational and unnecessary thing to do. And frankly, he was able to coerce a lot of the things that he wanted just by rattling his saber, by putting the troops on the border. But he did it, uh, and he has, he has unleashed this destruction and this, and this misery, and he bears the moral and the legal responsibility for that. All of that said, when you talk about kind of post-conflict opportunities, um, one of my biggest regrets is that over the last 20 or 30 years, when the United States had you know, disproportionate power relative to almost anyone in the world, China was not what it is today, Russia did not have the ability to push back, and most of the world was desperate to join American projects, to be kind of part of the club. Um, my feeling was we just didn't have the attention span for problems like the development of post-Soviet Eastern Europe. We had Ukrainians, we had Moldovans, we had Belarusians, you know, we had Balts, we had people in the Caucasus all over this region just absolutely desperate uh, for the kind of investment and partnership from the United States that could have lifted them up out of desperate and vulnerable post-Soviet situations. So part of why we ended up with the story in Eastern Europe that we have today, in addition to aggression from Putin's Kremlin, is that they didn't have good governance in the first place, right? They had, they had corrupt regimes dominated by oligarchs that were playing footsie with 
Putin and the KGB because opportunistically it was good for them to do so instead of having a consistent level of partnership from the United States with the attention and the resources that that would have needed. And lest you think, oh, that would have been a waste, where would we have gotten the money for that? Well, look at the money that we're having to spend today to help Ukrainians fight a war. And I think everybody knows those numbers. They're very big. I want to ask you about the role that nuclear weapons have have played in terms of governing this conflict and our response to it and, and the world's response to it. Um, even though, you know, there's only been, I think, marginal references to the use of nuclear weapons, I think especially at the beginning of the conflict, it, it seems to have very much steered how everybody has responded to uh, this encroachment and just how far other countries are willing to go to engage with Russia. I think that's right, and there are some fundamental facts in this conflict that are that are stubborn and inescapable. One of them is that Russia is one of the world's two preeminent nuclear powers. It's true that China also has nuclear weapons and a number of other states. Um, thankfully, not all yet. Um, we're going in a troubling direction in terms of nuclear proliferation. But Russia and the United States far and away have 80 or 90 percent of the world's nuclear arsenal. So we are talking about a country that has the capability, if Vladimir Putin wakes up tomorrow with a bee in his bonnet, he can end life on Earth as we know it in under an hour. I mean, that should be a chilling recognition. And I think that for the President of the United States, whatever one thinks about his policies on managing this particular crisis, the, the war in Ukraine, he has had clarity from the very beginning that an unacceptable outcome is that the United States and Russia are in a direct military conflict because of the unacceptable risk that that would cross the nuclear threshold, that that would move to maybe, you know, what people talk about as a tactical nuclear weapons use. I I think that distinction can be a little bit confusing, and understandably so. Any nuclear weapons use is a horrific tragedy and possibly opens the door to more nuclear weapons use. But when Vladimir Putin says, for example, or some of his advisors will say, you know, Russia would have the right to use a nuclear weapon if NATO forces moved into Ukraine. This is actually reminiscent of our policy during the Cold War, which was that the Soviet Union had overwhelming conventional forces on the ground in Europe, and America only had, you know, what, a few hundred thousand, and it would have taken us time to get more forces over to Europe. So our policy was, if the Soviets came rolling through the Fulda Gap in Germany, we would pop off some tactical nuclear weapons to signal to them slow down until we could get our forces into place. We're back in that same dynamic, and it is just as scary and just as troubling as it was during the Cold War. Britt Hester, I want to ask you, um, having a guest like uh, Matt Rajansky, obviously a great thing for the community to be able to go to this event. Tell us a little bit about how people can see him speak tonight and um, getting involved in the World Affairs Council. Yeah, so, and essentially tonight is an event that is open and free to the public. Uh, but complimentary tickets are required for that. And the way that they can go and get those tickets is at our website. <clears throat> uh, it's at the World Affairs Council, jacks.org. <clears throat> I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> or they can call our office at 904-280-8162. Um, again, what we hope is that people will come out. This is an event for anybody who's interested in these issues. Uh, you know, we, we believe in lifelong learning and <clears throat> bringing the world closer to Jacksonville. So for anybody who's interested in this, this is a great opportunity to come and hear Matt speak tonight. <clears throat> and then also, if they're interested in becoming a member, they can go on our website and find a little bit more information about that. I want to ask you, Matt, about, um, you know, the lead up to this conflict, whether, first of all, you know, there was a time, I think, where you others were more optimistic about outcomes. Um, I wonder if you think that that was, you know, underestimating what was going to happen and what this leader would do, or if you think that Putin has just radically changed in terms of how he interacts with the world and his advisors? So, number one, yes, I think Putin has changed. Um, But number two, that's no excuse. I got it wrong, um, along with a number of other experts. Uh, I didn't think he would do this. I thought he was a rational actor. Um, Cynical, yes, evil perhaps, but, but rational. Um, and this was a fundamentally irrational thing to do, and I will tell you why. Um, this is where I think I got, I got at least part of it more right than, than many experts did, and that was I was 100% certain the Ukrainians would fight, and so the math just didn't make sense to me. 175,000 Russian troops, heck, even if it had been half a million Russian troops, invading a country of more than 40 million people 
that is the largest country by territory in Europe that doesn't want to be occupied. That math doesn't work. We saw how hard it was to you know, pacify small parts of Iraq and Afghanistan when people didn't want to be occupied, or Vietnam, right? So I knew that the idea that Russia would roll in and in three days, as many U.S. officials were warning, that's why you know, the U.S. pulled its, its uh, embassy staff out of Kiev and sent them to Warsaw, that the Russians would be in Kiev and, and would have essentially taken over half or nearly all of the country. Uh, to me, that wasn't plausible. But what was equally implausible from that vantage point was that Putin could be so wrong, that he could have such bad information about the views of, of ordinary Ukrainian people and that they would just accept a Russian occupation. Because I had spent the last two decades living and traveling in Ukraine, and I knew for sure that that wasn't the case. Now the world knows that story. Now we all know about you know brave, heroic Ukrainian resistance, Zelensky, who's become the symbol of that around the world. But I think at that time, you know, we were mostly wrong about that. We were wrong about Vladimir Putin. Um, and I do think that Putin changed because I think as recently as 10 or 15 years ago, um, it would have been possible and it was possible on some issues uh, to actually deal with Putin directly as cynical as he is. You know, let's not pretend we don't have plenty of other international partners that we deal with, including some that we refer to as friends or allies or partners um, who are very, very cynical. Uh, and who do some bad things in their own country. So not a defense of Putin or his system in Russia, but only to say, I do think it's changed. I think we're in a fundamentally different era now where, in a sense, we're also waiting on change within Russia before really anything meaningful can happen. You talk about, um, you know, his misapprehension of the challenge and the resistance that he would face, and that being, you know, somewhat delusional. But, of course, even our own country has gone into wars and conflicts expecting that we're going to be greeted as liberators and um, we probably think our leaders are somewhat less delusional than Vladimir Putin. So it seems like sort of a common uh, misapprehension. Yeah, no, and I love uh, and I love the way you're sort of bringing this to the wider story of human conflict. I think this is also the, the wider story of uh, authoritarianism, which is you're surrounded by people who try to detect and understand what it is you want to think about the world and just reinforce that impression over and over. And so as Putin has moved from being, you know, an elected leader to then kind of a more and more authoritarian leader to now a nearly totalitarian leader, right? He is increasingly surrounded by yes men who tell him only the things they think he wants to hear. And then I think, you know, I'll talk more about this tonight, and, and I thank uh, the World Affairs Council and, and Britt very much uh, for inviting folks to come. Um, you know, I think COVID changed a lot. This, this man went into near total isolation for a year and a half, where literally in order to be in the room with him, you had to isolate for two weeks. And so it was a very limited number of Russian officials who were willing to do that. And I think he came away with those people's view of Ukraine and of the world. I think at one point, and you've brought up a picture that shows him sitting with his advisors and they're, you know, half a mile away across the room. It's this is this is not normal stuff in human history. Right. And this shows you a man. I'm not going to pretend to be inside of his head, but it shows you a man who's in a very unusual position. Uh, that he is able to do that, right? Most political leaders need contact with their people. And that Putin was just simply able to do that and retain leadership mm -hmm. for years on end, um, that's pretty unusual. And, and that he actually believed that he knew more than the people around him who were in touch with the forces on the ground also tells you something about the nature of that system. We're talking about the Russia-Ukraine conflict with regional expert and national security advisor Matthew Rajansky, you can join our conversation by giving us a call at 904-549-2937. You can also email firstcoastconnect at wjct.org, or you can message us on Facebook, Instagram, or X. Um, in terms of, you know, the Russia problem, um, I know that you have spoken about, you know, people's maybe simplistic view of, you know, displacing a, a despot or a, a dictator um, as a solution when, in fact, you know, the alternatives, the possibilities of who might fill that vacuum are maybe even worse. Um, talk a little bit about that. I mean, we did have a very near sort of conflict of that kind with Prigozhin. Yes, um, that, that is definitely a, a case in point of be careful what you wish for. Um, it is true that if there was going to be a violent struggle for power in Russia today, just everything I know about the system, everything I know about the, the kind of... Um, alignment of forces suggests to me that the folks who'd come out on top would be at least as nationalistic and hostile to the West as Putin is. 
uh, maybe much more so, right? And Prigozhin is actually an interesting example of that. Again, totally cynical and totally corrupt. Um, doesn't stop him from hating us even more. Uh, and, you know, you look at Ramzan Kadyrov, the dictator of Chechnya, who's sort of like a weird mix of a super corrupt oligarch with like a Islamic fundamentalist and has a private army of something like 30 or 50,000 men at arms. You know, he carries a gold-plated Kalashnikov, right? Like the, these are not good men. Um, but these are the kind of folks who are at least in a position to try to seize power in a violent struggle. But that said, I don't think that's the only option for Russia's future. I have enormous faith and confidence in the literally thousands of particularly young Russians who are doing creative things to organize civil society, to get truthful information into a country that is, you know, not yet in a, in a Chinese or North Korean state of kind of internet blockade. You can actually still communicate directly with Russia through various secure messaging apps and independent media. Um, these are some of the things that, that my foundation, the U.S. Russia Foundation, supports um, that we believe in the long term are key to keeping Russians informed about reality. Because at the end of the day, these are people. These are people with families who go to work every day, you know, who want to live decent lives. And you know, they may have to accept certain realities of this horrific situation they find themselves in, including that their you know, authoritarian leader has taken their country into a war where their sons and brothers and husbands are being sent to the front and dying. It doesn't mean it's something that they like. Um, and so I think as long as we can continue to get truthful information to them and retain some of the skills that were built up over the last 30 years, entrepreneurial skills, legal skills, professionalism, very basic kinds. I think there's a kernel there of hope that Russia can gradually rebuild something like a democracy and a free market. Your great skill set or one of your great skills has been, you know, your involvement in, you know, the world of Russia and your, you know, your conversant with the people there, the culture, um, obviously the language. Um, but you mentioned earlier that you are you've been placed under sanction. You no longer are able to freely travel. How does that impact your ability to gather the information that you use to make your analysis? Yeah, it it really sucks. <laughs> I mean, I I used to end my lectures always by saying, "Don't take my word for it. Go and see Russia." I don't think I realized when I was saying that ten years ago what a time limited opportunity that was when I told audiences like, you know, here in Jacksonville or Colorado, California, all around the country I would talk and I would say, Go and see Russia you know, I would have I would have shouted it louder to the rooftops if I'd only known what was coming and that it would truly be let me be clear, I don't recommend that your listeners go and see Russia now. I don't think it's safe. You know, Americans are taken hostage there. It is a very bad situation. You know, I was put under sanctions just because, just because I was a name that they knew and that's how we do sanctions. It's tit for tat. We put names on a list. They put names on a list, right? This is a dark time. Um, and yet, if you don't get to know one another on a human level, if you don't have that contact and that connection, then conflict is much, much more likely. And you can go back to you know what I said earlier about nuclear weapons, that the one danger that is, I think, unacceptable because it's existential for the human species is a direct war between Russia and the United States. That cannot happen. I want to ask you about funding for Ukraine, because obviously that's been tangled up in border and migration issues, um, really seeming more political than strategic or thoughtful or anything else. I'm just curious um, how you see the intractable Congress and our you know, inability to fund or unwillingness to fund Ukraine at the present time, what, how, how that's going to you know, impact this conflict writ large. Yeah, well, of course, if the United States uh, doesn't bring the assistance package uh, to Ukraine up to par, then the Ukrainians will have to go forward with much less than they need. And the result of that, I think, will be self-explanatory. It will be it will be harder for them to hold the line, harder for them to fight. The flip side of that, I, I do want to be clear, I, I don't know that um, the, the hardware and the money that's on offer now necessarily means that they can win the conflict. I think we have to be realistic about that. And, and some of the critics, you know, fairly make that point that that doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to provide support. Cutting it off now, I think would be, it would be a big mistake. But, um, you know, I want to make two other points. Um, one is that, you know, support for Ukraine on, on this kind of scale could have been used a decade or a decade and a half ago transformatively. To you know, literally, uh, totally reinvent the country as a prosperous Western free market democracy with strong democratic institutions. Now, you know, we'd have to pay 
orders of magnitude more to fight a war and only then begin to think about reconstruction and the post-war, right? So this is the disaster of allowing a situation to fester in this way. Um, and, and second is I'm very glad that people are asking hard questions about, you know, what does our uh, assistance money buy us and for how long, what does as long as it takes actually mean? I'm actually really glad people are asking those questions. I hate that those questions are being used as a partisan cudgel to show that, you know, someone else is stupid and therefore you shouldn't vote for them because that's the wrong context in which to ask these questions. Well, Matthew Rajansky, thank you so much for being here. It's excellent to talk to you. Um, you'll be speaking tonight at 7 p.m. at the Adam Herbert University Center on the campus of UNF and ticks are available, right? Yes. right? Okay. Yes. So you go to the World Affairs Council, jacks.org and get some tickets. Um, really appreciate your insights. Thank you so much for sharing. Thanks so much, Anne.